It's an absolute pleasure uh, to welcome you all to the third plenary, which is on politics of recognition. And we have two very exciting speakers, and I'm sure you'll have tons of questions after they finish speaking. Um, I'm Sahela, based at the Institute of Development Studies, and I've been with ESID since, it's, since 2011. Um, and uh, uh, it's an absolute honor to be able to do this for me. Uh, so uh, we have two speakers, as I said. Uh, Professor Jima will go first. I don't think he needs any introduction, but I will still give you my spiel. Uh, Professor Jima is based at the Department of Political Science at University of Ghana. Um, all, those of you who work on Ghana, Sub-Saharan Africa, I'm sure you have engaged with the work of uh, CDD, and he's the founder of CDD. And those of you who use the Afrobarometer, I don't need to ex sort of tell, give you the spiel about his role in uh, development of that. Um, so Professor Jima will be talking about democratic governance and socioeconomic development, and uh, are there any linkages? Um, and uh, then we will have Professor Anne-Marie Getz. Um, she also needs no introduction. She's a, prof a professor at NYU, and before that she was at UNIFEM. And before that, she was at IDS. So a lot of us have different types of links with Anne-Marie. And uh, she has published quite a lot. Um, and most of you are familiar with her work. So I'll stop there, and I'll ask Professor Jima to take us away. You have 30 minutes. And if you're over time, I'll wave my pink scarf. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And again, uh, thank you, Esid. Thank you, Sam. Um, thank you, David, for the opportunity to be here. As I said yesterday, I um, came, and happily so, out of gratitude to um, ESSET. Uh, I was there from the beginning, but I was not there for the rest of the time. And so it's nice to see uh, all the great output turned out by ESSET both in terms of solid intellectual content and also in terms of uh, capacity building for, and it does intellectual capacity building for a whole line of uh, African scholars and, um, and policy actors, including Dr. Asante and very soon uh, Edward Amprechum. Uh, so I'm grateful for that. But also, this is all to say that I basically checked out of academic research um, some years back, uh, at least six years back. And so um, I haven't been actively following up on all the great intellectual debates going on about democracy and development. And so I cannot, you know, what I'm going to present to you is nothing deeply academic, it's just um, there are, they are reflections. I call them uh, maybe three-part reflections, or reflections of, uh, from three angles on uh, the issues of democracy and development. First, from basically personal impressions and uh, anecdotal evidence uh, picked on the signature case of Rwanda, or example of Rwanda, and then um, mass opinion and perception data from the Afrobarometer, uh, with which I've been working for some time, and then something of a comparative historical experience of the socioeconomic development in Ghana under a democratic political regime since 1992, and uh, the inherent synergies as well as tensions um, that there are. So uh, first, let me, let me start with the... Um, the personal impressions of Rwanda and um, media reports and what I make of it in terms of the, the debate. That's the long-standing debate over democratic governance as an aid or impediment to economic and social economic uh, development in late developing uh, nations as um, Af African countries are. Just to say that I've been to Ru Rwanda only twice in the past six years, and uh, only for a few days uh, on each visit. And so, you know, I don't have a whole lot, you know, deep, 
knowledge of the place or anything. I can't claim anything like that. But just to say that I went on my first trip as a member of the advisory council of the uh, Ibrahim Index of African Governance. And um, when we went, I, as many in the team, were highly favorably impressed with what we saw of the economic and social progress of, Kig of Kigali. In this case, I'll say Kigali uh, at the time, especially in the light of um, its recent history. But also something about why we were there in the first place uh, was impressive and at the same time uh, instructive to me. We had been summoned to Rwanda uh, to explain by, by the Rwandan government, uh, to explain uh, Rwanda's ranking on the index, which the country's leadership deemed unfair and based on inaccurate data. And for some three days, we were uh, quite you know, interrogated quite deeply on the sources of the data that we used, on the methodology, um, and especially on the interpretation of the data, which they um, particularly pointed out to us that um, they, uh, they thought we had, you know, had not taken the country's unique history into account or sufficiently attended to that, but also, most importantly, they disagreed with some of the data sources um, and declared some of the uh, sources as um, sources that are inherently um, the enemies of Rwanda, to quote. But nonetheless, uh, we did our best to explain to them they seemed to understand and they did say that, well, well uh, let's see how it goes. And we've continued to, the, the index has continued to include Rwanda, and uh, Rwanda has been actually quite well performing compared to many other countries and also in the light of its history. I went there the second time uh, just last year, and this time, uh, as, again, as part of um, the Mo Ibrahim Foundation um, Governance Weekend event in Kigali which itself was something of a recognition of the achievements of Rwanda in the, in, 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 since, since it's a horrible uh, genocide, civil war. And, um, but again, in that encounter, in the sessions uh, with President Kagame fully present, it was, it was also exhilarating and strange that Rwanda has made even more strides, even more impressive uh, gains in development, social and economic development than when I was first there. Um, the president was uh, well, you know, welcomed the, 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 the event uh, wholesomely, uh, fulsomely, and then, um, but as I sat there and listening to a live interview he had with president, with, uh, with Mo Ibrahim, the, the founder of the foundation, about his plans for retirement. I thought I had a familiar frame about where the people would decide. Well, uh, it was just um, not the same command performance I am used to hearing or seeing from President Kagame when uh, he interviewed about the social and political progress of his country, economic and uh, political progress of his country. So, but nonetheless, what I observed on those two visits broadly correspond with the academic and media pundit reports regarding the country's remarkable economic and social development under President Kagame's autocratic rule and not so long after coming out of those horrendous events. So notwithstanding my many outstanding normative and other doubts, I am willing to uh, happy to give Rwanda a pass that it serves as some example of um, uh, development under non-democratic, maybe uh, quirky authoritarian rule. So now let's uh, look at the Afrobarometer, uh, which offers relevant data 
on Ghana and uh, 33 other countries, not including Rwanda, however. Because they seem to provide, they provide insights into citizen perceptions of democracy, their freedoms, their government performance on economic and social issues, and their own economic well-being. And so uh, maybe I'll tell part of the story from, from these slides. So we've been, we've, we've, we've been tracking uh, the supply of democracy uh, in the countries where we do the survey uh, based on the perceptions of whether uh, the country is a functioning democracy and whether the citizens or respondents are happy with the way democracy works or are satisfied with the way democracy works or is working in their country. And this is what we found in um, round seven, 2016-2018, when we, 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 uh, we asked that question, um, ranging from a very high uh, percentage of respondents in Ghana declaring um, uh, uh, countries to be both good in terms of uh, being a functioning democracy and also who express satisfaction with the way democracy works in our country. Those of, those of you who are familiar with some of the Afrobarometer publications will recognize that this is our standard uh, measure of the supply of democracy. It's a combination of uh, two variables, extent of democracy in your country as you perceive it, and then the degree to which you are satisfied with the way democracy works in your country. Then, but we also constructed a, more, a bit more complex, multi, uh, very, multiple variable um, index of uh, the, the supply of democratic governance. Uh, the first one uh, being more procedural uh, than substantive. This one a little bit more substantive, um, where we are looking at those who, the percentage that uh, say they, you know, they felt free to say what they think or they didn't have to be careful about what they say in politics or they don't have to be careful about which political organizations they join or they don't have to be careful about how to vote and that the um, last elections in their country was free and fair and that they have no fear of political intimidation or violence, or that their president generally respects the decisions of the courts, or that the uh, prevalence that officials who commit uh, crimes uh, do not get away uh, with their crimes, that they are indeed punished. And these are the percentages, the responses, so the scores that we got with Botswana at the very top uh, in terms of uh, supply of democratic governance and then Gabon at the lowest in terms of supply of the same. So then we also uh, constructed a supply of economic and social goods index. Uh, divided it to um, supply of economic management, of good economic management, or government economic management performance index. And that is got derived out of improving the economy, improving living standards of the poor, um, creating jobs, keeping prices stable, narrowing gaps between the rich and the poor. And here again, uh, Botswana comes on top of the, um, of the it index in terms of the scores, and then Sudan um, uh, came the places bottom. Then we also have a social development performance index um, with all the variables uh, listed there. Uh, and then finally, we have we, a standard index we've been doing on the alphabet called Lift Poverty Index. That's um, 
experience with material deprivation regarding um, how often um, the respondent or somebody in their family, uh, their family members have gone without enough food, enough clean water, I mean, how many times, rather, gone without enough food to eat, enough clean water to drink, um, gone without medicines or, or medical treatment, or gone without enough cooking fuel, and gone without uh, cash income. And <clears throat> on this, um, you find that Gabon um, scored highest in terms of um, percentage of people in the country who had experienced uh, various <clears throat> types of material deprivation. Um, uh, it's lowest for countries like Mauritius, Morocco, Ghana, and Quebec. We also just took a quick look at uh, GDP annual growth rates, and um, uh, that's just the standard GDP annual growth rates that the World Bank and others do report. So now let's go to the to the linkings. And first, we, we find we find that supply of democratic governance and supply of democracy are positively correlated with first perceived government performance and economic management, uh, per perceived levels of social development, and then uh, GDP growth, and then negatively correlated with experience of poverty, of material depri deprivation. But we do also uh, accept and understand that this type of data has its own limitations, especially with respect to, it doesn't offer um, a wholesome answer to the question of whether uh, democracy uh, is in, does, it, it just gives some um, associations, it gives some broad linkages, but as you know, um, cause it, correlation does not <coughs> indicate causation. And then we did further uh, regression analysis, which confirmed again the influence of democracy on all four indicators of social and economic development. And uh, perhaps, you know, let me just move on here yeah, and just show this that um, you look at the, the start the supply of democracy um, regression showed that, you know, it, it, perceptions of economic performance were indeed high. Perceptions of social development high, GDP growth high, and then uh, reported experience with, uh, with, with uh, poverty or deprivation also lo low. But again, there are limitations because you find that um, there are some, some countries that reported high levels of um, supply of democracy and democratic governance, but um, not great on economic, in the assessment of government, economic performance, and so on, though a majority of those countries confirm the broad linkage. Late poverty, again, some uh, countries that reported high levels of democratic governance, and indeed also uh, reported low lived poverty. But there are others like, you know, where uh, the opposite is also true. So that is all to say, without boring you too much, um, there are question marks about the linkage, even though, broadly speaking, there is a linkage, and broadly speaking, the linkage seems to be robust. So let's, let me now get on to uh, the, um, how we feel to sort of get a knockout punch from alphabarometer data. Um, and I want to uh, look at Ghana and uh, Ghana's experience with, um, with social and economic development 
in some sort of comparative historical perspective. First, it's no news to any of you here, I, I, I doubt, that um, Ghana has charted a consistent path of democratic politics um, roughly since the early 90s. There, it has a liberal democratic constitution uh, that is still um, a common point of reference for uh, citizens. Um, it has free media, it has vibrant civil society, it has a vig vigorous political contestation, uh, highly competitive elections, seven of them uh, all together and still counting, and uh, three of them have produced uh, electoral turnover, uh, something of a record in, on, on the continent. But, and it's also the case that Ghana's democratic governance progress in the Fourth Republic has been accompanied by social and economic development. Economic growth rates have averaged about 6.5% in the last 10 years. Uh, GDP has more than doubled uh, from 28 uh, billion, uh, roughly 28 billion dollars in 2008 to 65 uh, billion dollars in 2018. Uh, Ghana has become a lower middle income country within the period with per capita income of about 2,202 um, in 2018 compared to um, 12,000 uh, roughly in 2008. Uh, successive administrations in the period of uh, uh, return to democratic rule have uh, expanded access to basic education uh, partly uh, to be in compliance with the constitutional injunction uh, to promote universal education progressively. You know, so uh, within the period, Ghana has gone from something called free compulsory universal basic education uh, in the late 1990s to uh, the free senior high school um, since 2017. A national health insurance scheme uh, has been introduced um, uh, since the mid-2000s, uh, which has vastly expanded uh, health care coverage. And not surprisingly, Ghana's score um, on the Human Development Index is higher today than before. And the country was among the first in, in Africa to achieve some crucial Millennium Development Goals goal targets, and um, that's also to say uh, there's been significant uh, poverty reduction. So as a 60-something-year-old Ghanaian uh, who has lived under different political regimes in Ghana, uh, that's military authoritarian regimes, including that of Flight Lieutenant Jerry Rawlings and then the multi-party democratic constitutional governments, I should be forgiven. I believe I should be forgiven if I came away uh, with the impression uh, that democratic regimes are better at providing social and economic development than uh, their non-democratic counterparts. But I will be remiss if I don't also uh, point out that there are major gaps and challenges uh, prevalent in Ghana's social and economic uh, development trajectory. Uh, first, and as many have commented, there is lack of structural transformation of the economy, which is reflected in the continued reliance on commodity exports and low agricultural productivity. There is also worsening inequality. Um, the Gini coefficient in 2018 or so was roughly about 43.6. And there is growing indebtedness, really uh, exponentially growing indebtedness. And then also 
I would have to concede that some of these, pop, I mean, first, just let me throw in a few caveats that some of these problems uh, can be blamed on democratic politics or the brand of democratic politics uh, practiced in Ghana. Um, for instance, borrowing externally, uh, there's been a lot of borrowing, um, the standard borrowing, driven by uh, government's need uh, to, to, to spend. And the need to spend quite often driven by election cycles and, and the like. Uh, there is the persistent north-south economic and social development gap. Despite the broad, the emergence of broad party um, consensus on inter-party consensus on the need to address the problem. And this, the, the gap has persisted partly because of the blatant political partisanship and corruption in the bureaucracies and uh, the way in which uh, funds are used in the various situations of the so-called Savannah Development Authorities. Um, again, um, part of the problems that uh, democracy has uh, brought to uh, bear on and, uh, negatively on, on the economic and social development of Ghana is politically induced, especially illicit political financing uh, corruption. Politically, politically induced corruption, especially for for political financing purposes, and also um, overpriced, typically brick and mortar, public infrastructure focus, and election cycle driven policies and programs, and election year overspending. In one election year, I think 2012 or uh, 2012, Ghana, you know that. Ghana spent, it was, uh, the government expenditure was about 12% of GDP in that year in deficit. Um, and even when it's low, it's, up, it's around 6%. And then, and, and, and on and on. So that's all to concede that, yes, some of the problems of um, the limitations of social and economic development in Ghana have indeed been caused or have something to do with uh, democratic politics or at least the way democratic politics is done uh, or democracy with Ghanaian characteristics. Then again, in the, some of the economic and social development achievements I can accept uh, have nothing to do with the political regime under which they have occurred. They may have more to do with the HIPIC debt reliefs and other development aid um, the country uh, has received and has been receiving. Uh, they may have some, a lot, something to do and a lot more to do uh, with the uh, boom in commodity, glo global commodity prices fueled by China's rapid economic growth. They may have something to do with the emergence of oil as an export commodity in recent years and they may have something to do with the um, availability of international private finance capital, and um, especially uh, in the way that Ghana has been accessing euro bonds since 2007. So uh, to get to uh, the final part of the presentation, uh, you may ask, what has democracy then got to do with Ghana's social and economic development progress? I would argue that it has provided the political legitimacy needed for government to initiate some really unpopular policy changes and programs. It has definitely helped and provided a context for the improvement in domestic revenue mobilization uh, through the introduction of value-added tax, uh, just to note that uh, Ghana, Ghanaian government's 
shied away from introducing value-added tax for a long time, and when the elected J.J. Rawlings government tried to introduce it in the mid-90s, it was faced with fierce opposition, uh, civilian opposition, led by the then opposition, which was outside parliament. And so, as a result, the law couldn't be passed until after the next election, when a substantial um, opposition caucus emerged in that parliament, and that caucus agreed to vote for the, for the, for the VAT to be introduced. So also to note that since that time, you know, originally when they introduced it, it was 10%. Uh, since that time, um, uh, it has moved from 12.5% and now 17.5%. So uh, successive elected governments have found the wherewithal to do, to, to do more uh, value-added tax legislation which could not buy legislation, something that previous non-democratic administration didn't dare to do. Um, we've, we've also seen within this era introduction of tariffs and uh, tariff increases on electricity, water. Uh, we've seen the introduction of toll roads and all kinds of uh, levies uh, that have come in within the era. Um, again, some of the tough privatization of state-owned enterprises and private house uh, have taken place within uh, the, the democratic era. And that is true that the military uh, authoritarian Jerry Rollins government did begin the process of privatization, but he generally shied away from some of the tough ones until, tougher ones until um, it had become, until it had gone through an election and the uh, Flight Lieutenant Jerry John Rawlings of the Provisional National Defense Council had become President Jerry John Rawlings of the elected National Democratic Congress. And um, with that, then came perhaps Ghana's biggest privatization at the time, uh, that of the Asante Goldfields Corporation, uh, which then uh, became, you know, met with, became Anglo Gold uh, Company. Um, since then, there have been more privatizations. There, there's been tel tel privatization of the Ghana Telecom, of Ghana Telecom Company, um, something that was ch challenged all the way to the Supreme Court by opponents of the, of the privatization, but which was eventually um, throw, you know, cases that were eventually thrown out and telecom privatization in Ghana uh, became a reality, fueling a real um, boom in the telecom industry uh, to date. Um, the, it's also the case that economic, some of the economic and social development um, progress have been driven by political parties and candidates who now realize that they must compete on the basis of macroeconomic management, on the basis of uh, social interventions, especially in education, health, uh, infrastructure development, and the like. And some of this is reflected in the growth of, uh, or the emergence of uh, policy content in party manifestos. And, um, the fact that you know party manifestos are now almost you know they are, they are treated as um, as uh, secrets uh, before election and uh, just so that you know the other party uh, doesn't uh, steal from them and so on. Uh, it's uh, then also I think democratic politics and progress on the democratic governance front has been an enabling factor in terms of the receipt of grants or offer of grants and development aid from an international community that seems eager to encourage and to support 
a democratic governance reform pioneer, such as Ghana. So here are my broad takeaways. One, uh, to say that Rwanda's experience after extremely violent conflict seem to validate at least tentatively claims of the developmental benefits of authoritarian rule that I consider that. But the same claim can also be uh, made on behalf of democratic governance and perhaps more robustly, at least from the from Afrobarometer survey data. What a comparative and historical review of Ghana's experience with economic and social development in this democratic age um, says what it, it does is to back the claim that there is some synergy between democratic governance and development in Africa. But I've also tried to, um, to suggest and to show that it reveals considerable tensions in the pursuit of economic development and social development in the same country. And so, yes, strong kudos to democratic governance in Ghana, uh, but with a lot of caveats and with a lot of limitations. Thank you. Um, so you heard Professor Dima, and um, I'm sure you have lots of questions. Um, in term, and you all are thinking about, well, what are the characteristics in my own country if you are from a democratic country? And what does democracy really deliver, particularly if you're looking at the question of inequality? Um, but we are going to move on to the next speaker. And um, then after Anne-Marie has spoken, we will go to Q&A. So Anne-Marie Getz uh, will be talking about the politics of uh, um, women's rights uh, development policy making and um, she has exciting things to say and very pertinent given that we are facing a backlash against women's rights all over the world. Anne-Marie. Thank you and um, good morning. Um, uh, I'm starting with a quote from Michel de Montaigne just to show that uh, it's not just um, James yesterday who can quote from uh, <laughs> philosophers. <laughs> and make them relevant uh, to today. So this was written in 1570-something, um, and uh, kind of um, brings out an important point about the rejection of some political settlements by women uh, on the grounds of their exclusion or the damn bad deal they got. Um, Michel de Montaigne wrote this about religion, actually, uh, speaking about uh, how women react to religious constraints. Um, and in most cases, religion is one of the worst political settlements um, that women have been dealing with uh, for a long time and in which there is remarkably little room for maneuver. Um, I'm going to actually start with this image, which is surely the most iconic uh, picture from 2019 of democratization. And this is a picture of a 22-year-old engineering and architecture student toppling Bashir from the top of a car in Khartoum. And um, uh, lots to say about this, well, and I won't actually, because I don't have time, about this particular um, revolution, but the, it was very striking for the level of women's engagement and the um, frontline work that they did um, in sustaining the protest, which the proximate cause, of course, was um, the removal of subsidies on food and fuel, and a Sharia law crackdown on women tea and food sellers on the street, an intolerable um, attack on their source of livelihood. Um, and that particular legal um, move was inspired by uh, Sudan's um, uh, supporters from Saudi Arabia to uh, keep the country in line with um, expectations about uh, strict Islamic um, provisions. Um, so the, at stake in, the, in this particular fight is, is more than just um, 
uh, not just, but is more than uh, getting rid of an authoritarian. It's also about looking at the problem of foreign interference in, um, in the country and the implications for women. Um, as we know, the situation there is horribly precarious. There is this new sovereign council of uh, five military and five civilians, and it includes two women. Who would have thought that that could happen in Sudan? Um, it's got a long way to go. Of course, the monstrous uh, architect of the Janjaweed um, attacks in, in um, Darfur, General uh, Hamdi um, Dagalo, is, uh, is on this council uh, in a pivotal position. So there's uh, a lot of work to do. And, and um, this and other uh, popular protests raise huge challenges for women in terms of thinking about how to alter upcoming political settlements uh, in their favor. Um, now, I don't know how much any of you followed this particular revolt um, in, in the UK or elsewhere, but this is a remarkable street protest success from Puerto Rico. Um, quite striking for the role of extremely young protesters, queer protesters, um, and uh, the speed of mobilization. Um, uh, the proximate trigger, of course, was the leak of chats between <coughs> Governor Rosselló and what he called his brothers, all men, um, in the government and private sector in Puerto Rico um, on July 10th, uh, journalists released uh, a few pages, just I think 11, initially about 11 pages of the chats, which focused mainly on the misogynist and homophobic content of the chats. Uh, and a few days, la days later, the Center for Investigative Journalism, headed by Carla Minette, released almost 1,000 pages of these chats, which almost read as a transcript of uh, pact making uh, between uh, a very closed circle of elites um, discussing how to divide up the spoils from emergency aid, FEMA, and so on. And this is, of course, these are people who had just shut down 300 schools on the grounds of austerity. Um, the, uh, the, the protests drew a, a million people onto the streets in July. And the population of Puerto Rico is only 3 million, so that's 30% of the population. And the uh, governor stepped down. The images I am going to uh, indulge in just for a second are so extraordinary. This is just a tiny sample. Um, but it's really striking, the, um, the defense of, uh, of equality, particularly because of the attack on trans and homo homosexuals in these chats, but also the virulent misogyny that um, denounced uh, women as putas, uh, men, of course, as mama bichos, and um, that urged uh, or called for, actually, explicitly, the murder of uh, women in political positions as a joke, really funny joke, um, but as a joke, but still, uh, you know, extraordinarily violent um, frat boy type exchanges. So the result, I have to show this because it's such an extraordinary picture, uh, a new leader being sworn in, uh, Wanda Vasquez as the governor. She's no big solution. She's part of Rosello's uh, circle, uh, not seen as a particular advantage yet, but just this picture of the Supreme Court justice um, and the new governor and uh, her daughter holding the Bible um, is such an unusual um, face of um, political deal-making. Okay, so um, in both cases, and there's others, I mean, we, uh, Hong Kong would be really interesting to look at as well in terms of the involvement of youth and women. Um, these are not necessarily the context in which one would have expected these explosions of activism, although one does in Hong Kong. Uh, from women, uh, Sudan and Puerto Rico, those are both contexts where women's organizations are actually significant and have been addressing massive gender-specific problems. I don't need to list them, um, so, but Sudan, as you know, has one of the world's highest rates of maternal mortality linked to poverty and illiteracy. Puerto Rico, the highest incidence in the world of femicide per capita, according to the uh, ACLU. 
So women here face a monumental challenge, as I mentioned, of seizing this opportunity while, in effect, the same political interests hold, uh, political and economic interests hold power. And this has not been a happy experience in other contexts of transition, um, where more firmly institutionalized social groups like parties and unions and male power structures have moved into new spaces uh, created by feminist activism. Um, and it points to the importance for us of understanding the political conditions that enable women to leverage their contribution to democratization into power and results. From a policy perspective, this, act this moment practically offers opportunities to design new public institutions and calls for guidance on institutional design features that are useful for ensuring or preserving women's access to power, opportunities to deliberate and aggregate interests and to form policy to address gender issues. Um, so uh, the challenges of passing gender policies that seriously challenge gender roles and the problem of the grudging implementation of such policies once they're passed by the male-dominated bureaucracy in most countries and the reversibility of gender equality in some authoritarian and right-wing populist contexts um, and also contexts that have just recently democratically transitioned to right-wing populist <coughs> regimes, is drawing uh, attention to the effectiveness or not of 25 years of gender mainstreaming in institutions, including development institutions, um, aid institutions in developing countries, um, and the effectiveness of women's movements in influencing competitive politics, and specifically in the deal-making involved in governing because as we are more than uh, aware, women's rights are remarkably easily and swiftly traded away. So in this talk, I'm gonna give an overview of some approaches to thinking about negotiating and sustaining um, gender equality policy in developing states. And I'm going to address some particular challenges when thinking about the conditions for the political effectiveness of the gender equality lobby. Um, and the eventual effectiveness of the state in implementing gender equality policy. So um, some particular challenges that we uh, have to always keep in mind when we're thinking about women's political effectiveness, um, or rather, let me just try say, the political effectiveness of gender equality um, advocates. That's a different thing. So the, po the political effectiveness of gender equality advocates who are not necessarily female, uh, and we call them feminists. Um, first, first problem, women's interests cross-cut all kinds of groups, all kinds of um, categories such as race and class and ethnicity. And frankly, actually, they rarely act together to protest um, their gendered situation in a unified way. They do, and when they do, that can have extraordinary consequences, as we've seen. Um, but some women may not even see gender-based injustice as intolerable. Um, those are called Republicans. <laughs> um, so this uh, weakens the political imperative uh, on parties and states to act, even though most states have acknowledged that gender-based inequality is an injustice and it imposes very significant social and economic costs that are extremely important in developing country contexts. The second point is that gender is a constellation of institutions. Uh, it's not just one thing. There's three major types of institutions that have to be changed through gender policy, and not all gender policy can address those. So the first one, the first institution, is the status hi hierarchy, and that constitutes women as a subordinate inferior group to men and justifies or tolerates pretty serious injustice, such as violence or... Um, denial of reproductive autonomy. The second institution is a market institution. It's the sexual division of labor, which uh, gives no value whatever to care work and considers it just fine that it goes unpaid and done by women. Um, and that preserves significant uh, economic roles and public decision making too for men. Um, and the third institution is normative heterosexuality that penalizes homosexuality as deviant and requires control of women's sexuality. Um, 
So this means that gender policy is enormously complex and it doesn't start or stop with equal opportunities. It challenges prevailing norms uh, of social organization and it questions not just sexuality, work and family life, but also the authority of religious institutions and the reach of markets. So to be blunt, it's usually pretty unpopular. It takes a very strong and determined state to actually enact gender equality policy. Um, just to summarize, it benefits a group that may not act collectively, that cross-cuts all of society, so it has little direct leverage, unlike other organized groups, because it's not a specific class or race that can threaten exit or disruption. It doesn't occupy one specific sector of the economy, except for a sector that nobody cares about, which is unpaid care. It doesn't occupy a specific geographical region, so it can't threaten secession. Um, and it tends not always to link, or rarely to link to a specific party. So that means that women don't bargain with ruling elites for the distribution of goods in a club or private, rather than a public basis. So this determines what women bring to, or may get from, navigating political settlements, since sometimes they bring relatively little in the form of electoral le leverage, and certainly in the form of rents and payoffs. Um, so they have a big challenge in substituting for the support of traditional elites in political bargains. And furthermore, what women want, even though that's always been a big question, what do women want? Freud didn't get it right. Um, what women want is, uh, is often not up for negotiation. So, um, for instance, what they want often is a restructuring of economies to value unpaid care, uh, to eliminate the sexual division of labor. Um, they want a restructuring of society, a restructuring of society to criminalize uh, violence against women to make it absolutely intolerable. So, um, so this is a specific challenge in political settlements of gender. Okay. So states matter enormously to gender, and so let me just quickly um, address the rather flippant subtitle of my talk. Of course, states matter. We don't have to make them matter again on gender. They matter. Um, they, feminists have always targeted states um, to promote le legal and social change, um, and they've relied on democratic deliberation to do this. And if that doesn't work, they've used multilateral forums to get around states, to um, develop international law, and then try to hold states accountable um, in the international arena. But what triggered my, my subtitle um, is that there has been a weird development in international gender equality work. Um, away from expecting that states can make a difference on uh, gender equality. Um, and this is a response uh, to state venality, incompetence, failure, bankruptcy, and the shift to right-wing populism, which has brought a reversal in uh, women's rights in some places. Um, so um, what, what I'm talking about is that the United Nations, which has been an incredibly productive arena for advancing women's rights, and in particular, the world conferences on, on women. The UN, and UN Women specifically, has decided that it's just not going to be possible to hold an international convening on women's rights next year, which is the 25th anniversary of the Beijing, the fourth conference for women, uh, the Beijing Conference for Women. As a matter of fact, ever since Beijing, the UN's been avoiding a global conversation on women's rights. And this is different from its work on other issues like environmental change or develop, uh, development financing. Um, the UN does not want a global negotiation on women's rights. Um, and this is because there's been a significant and widening global polarization between states on women's rights. Some states have become extreme antagonists. And some, on the, contra on, the, uh, on the contrary, are pretty strong champions. Some states practice feminist foreign policy now and are urging others to do so. But in, uh, in global forums on women's rights, and in particular in the annual commission on the status of women, consensus has become virtually impossible. And there has been a dumbing down to zero of discussions on women's rights. With the United States uh, under the Trump administration, uh, for example, leading um, the uh, efforts to claw back uh, advances on reproductive rights, 
Um, and recently, the United States has been deleting the word gender from UN documents, all UN documents that it discusses. Um, and it wants to talk about, um, about women's uh, family roles and responsibilities and reproductive functions. Um, so next year, instead of a, uh, a fifth world conference on women, the UN is proposing that it's going to have several uh, international meetings, but um, these are not going to be global. There's not, they are not going to involve all the nations of the world. The only countries that are allowed to come are those who remain that are prepared to recognize existing international agreements on gender equality and that are prepared to commit funds uh, to address uh, gender equality. Um, and instead of charting new legal, political, and economic ground in gender equality, what's proposed is a turn to the corporate world to accelerate improvements in women's conditions. condition. So this is a proposal, and I should stress it's only a proposal so far. It's not been fleshed out. Um, but the idea is that in Mexico and France in May and July next year, uh, there will be huge announcements of... Um, hybrids and coalitions between global corporations, uh, women's civil society organizations, some states, um, private foundations. And these action coalitions, that's what they're called, these action coalitions will selectively focus on gap areas in achieving gender equality and will mobilize supposedly enormous amounts of money um, to address these stubborn gap areas. Okay, first of all, these gap areas are not defined yet at all, and uh, it's unclear what precisely these uh, coalitions are going to, um, to do. Um, so UN Women clearly feels it can't rely on a liberal consensus between states um, to support equality. So the call for the, this huge engagement of the private sector, and even, by the way, I, for, I left out uh, prominent individuals, so there's a big focus on getting celebrities involved in these action coalitions. So this implies a shift in the understanding of the politics of policy change um, and in the power and cultural role of state authorities. It's a work around the paralysis, and it really is serious, in multilateral negotiations. But it implies that some states don't matter, or at least they're unreliable or irredeemable. Um, which is, uh, raises significant problems for accountability and the way policymaking and gender equality is, promote, is approached. So this shift to, to corporations, I'm going to have to use a word that uh, Marilee Grindle doesn't like. Um, this has been described as multi-stakeholderism by Susan George and Harris Gleckman. Um, it's not new, it's found in other areas. So uh, for instance, uh, um, Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General, recently announced a global coalition to address um, uh, the SDGs because states are not going to be able to deliver in time. Uh, in 2010, there was the Global Redesign Initiative of the World Economic Forum for greater cooperation between governments and unelected, unelected corporations. That uh, proposal from the World Economic Forum even suggests that the G20 should have some kind of voice, permanent voice and representation at the UN. Um, there's other uh, examples such as Gavi, the vaccine initiative, uh, which is run by the Gates Foundation, um, which is currently in dispute with the World Health Assembly on who sets immunization policy. Um, so on gender issues, the view is that these partnerships might deliver more resources and more conviction on gender and social change than states can. Um, this obviously raises all kinds of concerns about accountability, who's going to pick the issues that these organizations work on, um, uh, and uh, they may be choosing issues that are popular, like corporations in particular, co popular with customers and staff, but that may leave out very social, socially unpopular areas like women's rights. Um, so I will come back to this, but um, it's, it's a curious development that suggests that um, weak states can't do much for gender equality, and maybe that's true, um, but still, uh, that 
could herald a partial sidelining of, of the idea of working with states. Okay, so um, it's true that states have been weakened in all kinds of ways uh, by globalization, by globalized capital, by neoliberal policies. Um, the levers, the policy levers on which they rely, particularly on economic management and tax policy, have been diminished. And there's other ways where executive initiative and sovereignty are eroded. There's electoral interference with, um, and interference with public opinion by outside actors through social media manipulation. Um, there's curious uh, military incursions, the appearance of non-insignia forces in Ukraine, the um, disruptors on the streets of Hong Kong, the, uh, wearing the white shirts, I think. The, um, so this is challenging the analytical primacy of the state as a site of contestation um, in the distribution of power and resources, although I think that's somewhat exaggerated. Nevertheless, it's, it's unusual to see states uh, forge ahead with focused gender equality policy that includes significant public spending to mitigate the social costs women bear because of gender and motherhood. Uruguay is a really interesting case with its feminist social protection policy, for instance. And weak states have huge paradoxes, like Sudan. There's a perplexing mix of power and impotence, fragmented decision-making, multiple levels of government, pervasive intertwining of public and private authority and power, um, inability to generate tax revenue, and yet a remarkable capacity for surveillance, uh, imprisonment, and, and uh, violence. Um, and then, on the other hand, in other states where you wouldn't necessarily expect to see it, insecurity and migration and globalization have also triggered um, a, a strengthening of some aspects of the state. So Wendy Brown talks about, in an era of declining sovereignty, we're, wish we're witnessing the rise of borders and walls which represent anxiety over sovereign importance. So at the DSA last year, I argued that this kind of strange renationalization of the state often invokes and instantiates traditional versions of gender relations as an expression of national authenticity um, and includes a project of privatizing women under male control, particularly where fertility is falling. So this puts feminists in a dilemma. Feminists have always been very ambivalent about the state. Five minutes, no way. Okay, all right. So, all right, very quickly, feminists have been very ambivalent about the state. <laughs> Um, seeing it as uh, a reproducer of uh, gender inequality and, and at the same time as the main site of, uh, of possible progressive action. Um, because uh, to quote someone like Mona Harrington, since states create, focus, and condense political power, they may be understood as the best friend, not the enemy of feminists, because they can si uh, significantly disrupt the patriarchal and economic oppression of those in the lower reaches of class and sex and race hierarchies. And she goes on to say that states can attempt disruptions of, um, of politics or security in ways that are important because the state is a political power close to home and that it creates a significant space of freedom for women. And this, this interesting, very liberal approach sees the state as a valuable political community for women <coughs> and uh, the task for women is to make themselves meaningful to that political community. Right, so I am way out of time, and I, what I had wanted to do was talk about the determinants of the political effectiveness of the state, um, and I was going to go through in detail some frameworks for thinking about like what determines uh, the political effectiveness of um, the gender equality interests, sorry, in winning over the state. Um, this is, uh, think, frameworks for thinking about this have changed substantially since I attempted this one in 2003, which was looking at um, the ways in which m women mobilize in civil society, political society, and public bureaucracies to have their interests addressed. Um, this is a very institutionalist approach. Denise Walsh looks at uh, conditions for just or fair debate and deliberation across different institutions, um, looking at the quality of debate in particular, then the quality of democracy don't have time to go into it, but it's an interesting framework. Um, and then recently, I have looked in a lot of detail at the work of Sohela and Sam and Eleni Sifaki on uh, political settlements, which I love. And yes, I did take a picture of that framework from this book this morning because my formatting messed up 
on uh, my PowerPoint. Um, and uh, what I like very much about this rather pragmatic look at um, how women do under different political settlements is that it shows how women make themselves um, valuable to political, um, to, to dominant coalitions and um, uh, try to find ways to build leverage, uh, electoral or otherwise, um, in, in these coalitions. Um, so uh, it's um, uh, I, I've a valuable framework, but I don't have time for it except to point out that um, in, their, in their book, and many of the authors of the book are here, I know, you can see one at the back there, um, many of the authors are here, they find that the countries in the top row, Rwanda, Uganda, and South Africa, do best in terms of passing one particular kind of policy, which is policy to fight domestic violence. Um, these are dominant, personalized, dominant, um, institutionalized coalitions. Um, that is my finding, too, from around the world. Uh, and it's a disturbing, it's a little bit of a worrying one, because um, in many cases, what's going on is there's a temporary recognition by dominant um, groups that women are a convenient source of legitimation for under-legitimate um, uh, uh, regimes. And that uh, costs women horribly when it all breaks apart, as women discovered in former socialist states. Um, I, I also wanted to go into this, but there's no time. The, the fact that a very important gloss to add to this is that the level of reaction or opposition to gender policy will, will matter enormously according to whether gender policy is challenging class privileges of men in the labor market, um, or whether it's challenging men's status, and whether it challenges religious doctrine or not. Um, I, I know I'm out of time, right? Yes. Well, okay, so then I just I have to make this point. Um, okay, so um, the major imperatives of the state, the core imperatives, are sustaining legitimacy, security, and wealth creation <laughs> or accumulation. And uh, the tactic that gender equality advocates have used um, for a long time is making themselves essential for state legitimacy, arguing that democracy is not legitimate without their participation, arguing that um, no regime can be legitimate with their exclusion, no regime that tolerates um, grotesque mistreatment, uh, grotesque crimes against women. Um, but it's really striking that um, missing from my framework uh, and from all of the others, at least explicitly, <laughs> is a discussion of the domain of the market uh, or business activity. And um, uh, more discussion of the changing economic conditions that can transform political settlements and what they mean for women's power within these settlements particularly under austerity, which tends to erode women's power and make the prospects of policy advances uh, more difficult. More discussion of that is needed in these efforts to theorize the conditions for women's uh, political, uh, for the political success of the gender equality lobby. Um, now, arguably, because of the rich ambiguity of the terms that we use in political science, um, those of you I think it's all of you who work on political settlements would say, well, we do deal with the economy. That's the whole point of a political settlement is deals and rents, uh, deals with firms and rents for decision makers. True. Um, but it merits explicit consideration, I think, uh, because changing uh, economic frameworks structurally is so tremendously important for women's rights. Um, one of the possible reasons that uh, the market hasn't been uh, addressed explicitly in, in political settlement discussions on gender is possibly because uh, markets and firms are not seen as having a public or civic duty, unlike the public sector. So they cannot be appealed to on the grounds of constitutional norms, of equality, um, or international human rights, which have always been a fruitful arena for women to frame their claims. And perhaps the second reason for this exclusion is a real sense of unease amongst feminists about um, the current developmental approach to gender and the economy, which is based on the capitalization of women. Um, and Nancy Fraser has had a lot to say about this. 
um, where the emphasis is more on the economic actor contributing to economic growth and much less on the unpaid care economy, on decent work, and on structural changes needed to make economies work for women. Um, and a third reason, of course, uh, that uh, economic policy is um, sometimes uh, left out is because women are seen as actually terribly costly uh, for economic deals and for rent seeking because gender equality policy is seen, especially um, uh, social protection is seen as costing. Uh, it, it requires um, significant budgets. Okay, so I'm out of time. I was going to end, that wasn't my ending. I was uh, going to end by saying that um, we know that states and domestic policy competition and negotiation matter for women's rights, but in intention and commitment, um, state capacity, accountability, uh, is poor on gender equality. And in the long run, actually states are quite limited as resources for empowerment and require very, very strong feminist civil society pressure. There's no way around that. Indeed, instead of hoping that states will empower women, we need to think about empowering women against the state um, and enabling women to demand consequences for policy failures. Got a lot more to say, but I've got to stop. Thank you so much.